This is Clayton Howe's Entertainment X. For this episode, I chat with Jared Mazzacci, and we cover a little bit of everything from theater and film to energy and storytelling, education systems, and taking risks. So I hope you enjoy this part one with Jared Mazzacci. We're back. I'm Clayton Howe, and today with me on Zoom is Jared Mazzacci. Jared, thank you for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's awesome to be here. So much, so much I want to talk about. Uh, <laughs> uh, projection design, directing, the future of Broadway, um, Russia Troll Farm, so much more. Before we get to any of that, I want to take it back to the beginning of time for you. What were your entertainment dreams growing up? Yeah, I uh, I watched the Academy Awards, the Tonys. I, I was like... I would cry getting excited by watching people be recognized. I had kind of this like big, big idea of what, um, of what it meant to be an artist. And, um, and I, at a very early age, my parents supported me in the arts. And so at a very early age, I started writing, um, I had a theater that I, I had access to as a kid that let me like put put on staged readings even at age like nine and ten and um, and I just was like I just wanted to live a life in the arts that um, that made change. I think that was like I, I always just wanted to be a part of that artistic community that had deep impact in the world, and so. I don't know. It was both like the Cinderella story matched with like just feeling a profound thing happen when a group of people were in a dark room with shaped light. And it always moved me to tears. I was very emotional as a kid. So um, I think that that was like, that was a, a part of it. Um, and, uh, and I also, my first job at age 13 for five years was at a drive-in movie theater and I um, threaded the films. I learned how to splice the previews together. And I was able to watch that like muggy July air night with the beams of light hitting this in a, in a cornfield. Um, and I just remember like loving the space between the lens and the screen and everyone in between. And there was just something about that that felt magical. So, yeah. <laughs> When was the first time you picked up a camcorder? Um, in high school, I uh, I started making short films. And actually, my 18th birthday, I invited everyone over. I grew up on a farm, and um, everyone brought tents. And I got my high school to lend me the projector, the sound system, and the big movie screen for our auditorium. And I put it up against my back barn. And I, sh I aired probably like 30 five minute shorts that I had made over the last like year and a half to like 60 of my friends. And we camped out and, um, and I had like my friends play music in between like every 10. And, um, and so high school was like a big impressionable time of just making really, no one will ever see those shorts. They were really bad. Um, but, but like me jumping at a, at a street sign and then pre ask my friend to stop recording and then get on the other side of the street sign and like fall out. And it was like TikTok, but with like yeah. a high eight camera, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Well, I, I'm <laughs> I'm so curious on this blend because with such an infatuation and love for film, it didn't take you out of theater. So the balance between yeah. staying in live theater with film, how you view that? Yeah, I um, it was always an itch that I was never able to like satisfy the the balance between film and theater. I loved theater. I grew up on theater. I, I, there was something, um, epic about it. And actually the more I think back on my childhood, the more I think the movie theater and the theater theater, um, held the same dust for me, like the same kind of magic space. Yeah. So I actually like, th there wasn't a delineation between film and theater to me. I wanted to make both. I had always thought I would have to kind of balance a life in film and balance a life in theater. Uh, and I double majored in film and theater in college. Uh, and then my my sophomore year, I talked very publicly about this. And I, I gave a TED Talk six years ago about this. But my dad very unexpectedly passed away on a brain with a brain aneurysm. And um, 
in the middle of the day, uh, completely unexpected. And I gave a eulogy my sophomore year. Um, I went to Fairfield University and uh, my family grew up in New Hampshire. Um, I was raised in New Hampshire, I mean. And um, and so uh, they were all able to attend the funeral. And it was the year, it was around the year when Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind came out and I love Charlie Kaufman. And mm. I think that it was infused in the eulogy. So I had everyone close their eyes. Um, in the church and I kind of gave them a montage of what my dad felt like to me, not like specific memories, but kind of blends of memories. It was a, it was a poem. I still have it handwritten. I, I keep it with me. Um, and uh, at the end of it, my, my theater professors came up to her and said, make a play about this. This is incredible. And my film faculty said, make a film out of this. It would be incredible. Mm -hmm. And I just, these were two departments that said I would have to choose one of them as my major by the end of my time. And I never wanted to. And I think the grief of this made them both allow themselves to compromise <laughs> for that moment. I, I actually like accredit my entire career to my dad's passing because of, because I don't think that both of those heads of those departments would have caved in the way that they caved in that moment when I said, could I could I film some scenes that have to do with memory? And could I write a staged multimedia piece in which he is dealing? My sister had a baby three days after my dad died. Mm -hmm. And um, and I wrote a piece about their three-day relationship and, uh, and him releasing his memories while she is obtaining becoming human. Mm -hmm. And um, and they didn't, they weren't aware of it. They thought they were just there to judge each other. They didn't realize they're actually transferring uh, energetic familial. Uh, uh, histories to each other and um, and both faculty said yes and I got a humanities grant and I was able to get on backstage.com and get professional actors in on this and mm -hmm. we filmed in like 17 locations and including my hometown and uh, and then I did a two weekend run of this piece that then got me into grad school and um, uh, kind of put me on my track and so I, I don't know. I, I feel like I both stumbled upon it, but it felt very fate, fate driven of like, I, I don't think I ever would have been able to abandon one or the other. And in my TED talk, I talk about how film to me has an immortal quality. You can't change it. Or so we think you, you can't really change it. So being in an editing studio is your attempt at making it breathe and like live in a new way. And that skill set, I feel is entrenched in theater like that is liveness at its fullest like how do we make something that's seemingly chaotic consistent mm. uh and then in film how do we make something seemingly dead alive and that's mm. with cuts and edits and stuff and so there's this like kind of integral conversation around mortality and immortality that happens for me when i place film and theater together on the same stage that's what I appreciate about your technique uh, so much is the combo between live theatrical storytelling and then seeing something through a camera on the screen and how you blend the two. Because at least, and we'll talk, I could talk for a moment about working with you on Rain and Zoe over at University of Maryland, is that so much of your work, and tell me if I'm just completely projecting, <laughs> is completely energy driven i mean there are words yeah. involved in every show and we need them but it's you understand so well the energy and what a look or what a movement or what a word can affect in terms of feelings in a room and that it adds a lot of weight in a good way to proper storytelling yeah. what yeah. i think proper storytelling is you know living in a moment totally collectively totally i mean I, I the thing i didn't talk about is i i wanted to be an actor in film and theater my whole my whole upbringing and it wasn't until grad school that i started realizing the things i was writing and the things i was directing was actually my vocational calling mm -hmm. um but i'm glad i thought i was an actor for so long because i took meisner in new york city i i took a bunch of intensives in that i uh, at undergrad, we studied Stanislavski, Strasberg. Um, uh, in grad school, we studied viewpoints. Uh, I met Ann Bogle. 
Gar got to kind of like interrogate her with her process with viewpoints. And, and I actually believe, and this is what I teach at university of Maryland, that media is a scene, a scene partner. Mm. And so you need to understand beat builds. You need to understand objectives. What, the, what does the design want in that scene? Otherwise it get out, you, you know, like that, that if it's, if it is present in the scene, it wants something. It's not just a beautiful image in the back or a beautiful soundscape. It wants something thing and it yearns for something and it should be uh if that is energetic that is the yeah. thing that like underneath the text actors are scratching at all the time i i believe that is the same in a holistic point of view of the entire stage picture that it is it is something that has its own objectives and its own wants and those are sometimes aligned with the storytellers and other times opposing and both create tension yeah, it, it, along with that, the stamina you have <laughs> to keep working through those 10 days <laughs> and yeah. to get what you needed to get out of it. I am so curious where this work ethic came from for you, maybe growing up on the farm. Oh, man. it No, it's a fear of legitimacy, I think. <laughs> I think it's this, like, I actually think it's my Roman Catholicism and, like, shame and guilt that, like, must keep going because I am always not perfect. And um, no, I don't know. I, I do believe um, d- death plays a really big role in my life. I mean, losing my dad pr- prematurely, um, my, my sister lost her first, her first child uh, uh, in, in labor. Like I, I have witnessed a lot of, of um, a lot of like mortal questions in my life. And I just think like, you know, and then my grandfather died at 103. And so I think, I think I've just been structured and conditioned to believe that at any given moment, the dime will drop. And um, I just, legacy is really important to me. My, my dad made a deep impact on my life and Mm. um, I just want to keep at it. Mm. And, and I believe that like rigor and work ethic uh, you know, there, there's systematic problems in our industry right now about that. Uh, But I think we need to, uh, untether our own personal worth at work ethic what what do we want to do what fulfills us uh fu- what fulfills me is uh after everyone else goes to sleep working for two or three hours in the nighttime i love being a night owl mm. um and i do that on my own accord and i i re i i let things sink in um i become a, a really obsessed with the story i I, I maybe it's the the filmmaker editor in me that wants theater to have that same kind of rigor as something that is, is exported and constantly the same thing every time it plays out. Mm. And knowing that that's impossible makes it really fun to find the comedy and the fact that we cannot do that as humans. So I don't know. I, I just I'm really fascinated with it. Um, matched with my Roman Catholicism, guilt and shame. <laughs> I like that, <laughs> you know, fear of legitimacy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and I also, I also think like I, my whole life I've been, I've been told to take a, a path and I've never wanted to, I, I enjoy being out on limbs. I enjoy being in the gaps. Um, I find the most interesting people in those gaps. It's not just my own ego. It, it, I, I would like to believe it has very little to do with my own ego. It's, it's that I'm, I, I feel very selfish in that I feel like these trenches all, along the outskirts of the industry, living in this hybrid kind of um, experimental space, um, you find people who need who who have necessity inside that space that they they need that space in order to um, fulfill their identities as as humans on the outskirts of status quo and. Um, and I, I felt exceptionally fulfilled during the pandemic because it was the performance artist who continued making the work. And, um, and those, those rigors are different. There's no industry for them. There's no, there's no support system. They've made their own support systems. And so I like those people. I think that they have, they navigate the world in a different way than the rest of us. And I learn most from them. So I, I, that, that's my rigor is I feel like, um, Whatever I can bring to those spaces, I will, because it's most fulfilling to watch that work realize itself. Mm. Growing up, what did what did your parents teach you about kindness? Um, my dad was a, was a um, uh, it, 
self-employed educational consultant for special ed. And um, I think he taught me that there is a system in place that identifies what is normal and who are who is normal and that um, there are people that cannot operate well in those systems and we have deemed them not normal hmm. atypical and um, he crafted a life and career for himself that helped educational systems recognize that and and um, not so much mainstream special education but find um, find uh, environments for those students to thrive and and in fact actually sort of call out the teachers who really uh, who really locked down on status quo teaching strategies and um, he he, uh, he towards the end of his life he really wanted to create a almost Montessori school where you taught history through dance math through um, yoga you know like like finding ways to strip the classroom of desks and um, he always pointed to those kids and told me I would learn a lot from them um, and so that that's kind of the ultimate kindness I feel like I I hold on to in my life and, and career. Um, my mom is an incredible caretaker and a fighter, and watching her navigate um, taking care of my grandfather as well um, in his older in his older years, and also caretake for my dad's father, who who my dad was caretaker of, but then passed, and so we had to kind of take care of him. Um, my mom has kind of had inherited caretaking in her life. And I think watching that has also been uh, incredible for me. And and then growing up on a farm, mm. uh, uh, horses, sheep, uh, dogs, we, we, we had many litters of dogs and cats and, and Angora rabbits and, and sheep as well. And um, uh, to have to wake up every morning and have a consistent kind of rigorous schedule even in four or five feet of snow or continuing to snow in New Hampshire that those animals need to eat um, I think at a very early age I, I I learned about maintaining health and uh, and caretaking in in hard times so yeah. the education aspect is so important because and I only realized this after I graduated from college how how lack of a better word fucked you are <laughs> if you don't yeah. fit <laughs> into the existing yeah. education structure that's been around for years and that's what i think is so great about theater is that if you can educate someone without them realizing they're being educated they're being entertained you can take a lot of people yeah. to school and a lot of people can learn at all different levels of um you know education <laughs> any yeah. age yeah, all yeah, different yeah. ages i think that's what's so powerful about theater so yeah yeah i also i would add you know i teach at university of maryland the grad school here is tuition remission so the student the grad students don't pay tuition um we also pay a salary uh, uh upwards of twenty five thousand dollars annual salary for the students to be a student here um the the graduate assistantship labor has to do with shows um it's not just uh paper pushing mm. and um uh, it's a three-year program, and I find that when money is not the gatekeeper, um, there uh, there is a different type of gatekeeping, which is this like perfectionist uh, um, SAT like structure yeah. in our country, and it it permeates even in the arts uh, departments as well. And, and what I have told my grad students um, to varied success and failure is uh, I will recruit you if you show that you are proactive at getting what you want in a world that is telling you you cannot get it. And I will fight tooth and nail to hold the space for you to um, get that. And I thought that that would be enough um, and that my, my rigor as a teacher here would be uh, and, and my efforts would be towards the faculty and the space being like, no, this is okay. This is okay. This is what they need. And and it may 
stumble upon a new form, you know, like let's just let them explore with the, with the resources around them. Um, but actually there is, uh, uh, I have found there is a student internally led gatekeeping of, uh, that's very scary to be given full resource to say the thing, you know, the, the fear of what if I say it and it's not good. And, and it's like, well, but school good is not a word that should exist here. It, it should be experimenting. It should be, um, yeah. uh, but we're in our own way, you know, like we're in our own way as well. And, and I think culture tells us to be in our own way um, because there's such a judging culture out there. And yeah. so I, I just put that out there too, because um, w- even with good education, there's a lot of hard work internally that we need to provide ourselves to take risk. It's it's a hard it's a hard environment right now to take risk. You've been listening to Entertainment X, the podcast. You can follow Entertainment X on Instagram at underscore entertainment X underscore. If you haven't yet, go to Apple Podcasts and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. Join Clay next week for another curiosity conversation on Entertainment X. Thank you for listening. 